Hello, this is Robert Cockfield from Get Up Community Center Incorporated, and we're at 310 Kitty Hawk Road, University City, Texas, 78148. And you can go to our website at getupcommunity.org, and you can go to YouTube, look up Robert Cockfield, and you'll find uh, this slide deck and other stuff that I'm teaching. Or you can go to Facebook, look me up, and, and you'll see this also. Now, in 2021, my I have a goal. Uh, I teach for the for for profit, not for profit government. I'm a consultant. Been doing this for years. I love teaching. I'm an educator. I'm training developer as we speak and manager of the training material. And I'm teaching um, leadership stuff and, and business operations and, and uh, a lot of the other stuff. But I'm really starting it in this pandemic. I'm intrigued about church operations and not-for-profit operations. I've been in a not-for-profit environment for about 17, 18 years, and I was a preacher. Started out at 17, 18 years old. I've seen people come and go. I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've seen others make mistakes. And we don't realize, we don't like to talk about the business of church business or the not-for-profit. And I've gotten into robust discussions with church leaders who say church is not a business. I disagree. It, it, we do have to do business because we 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 deal with a lot of transactions and we're transactional individuals. You still have to pay your overhead. You still have your insurances and you still have regulatory uh, guidance from the IRS and from the city, state, municipals. From you got insurance uh, that you have to sustain and it has regulatory uh, things that you have to stay within the confines of it and. And we can go on and on. And even if you're doing proper accounting, you know, there's there's agencies that govern that too. And even if you are a not for profit, there are agencies that say that you're worthy not for profit. So it, it's a business. And you know, we ought to be about the business of God's business. But you know, Bible talks about business, be men and women. We got this, it's a business. So I want to talk about the responsibility of the church finance committee. What does that entail? Uh, so here's a few scriptures that deal with it. You know, and it's just a few. I mean, there's plenty more. But God has more than sufficient resources and means to abundantly fund the mission of Christ Church. That's true. And after all, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth of every mine belongs to the Lord. All of it belongs to God. And yet God directs Christian leaders to carefully be stewards of the resources, in other words, time, talent, treasure of God's kingdom, and to do so with a view to being held accountable for how we manage God's resources. Now, we can go to Psalms 24 and 1, Psalms 50, 10 through the 12 verse. We can go to Matthew 25, 14 through 30, Acts 4, chapter 35th verse, and Titus 1 and 7. These are just a few uh, that you can go to. So let's talk about the parable of the bags of gold, right? So if you read this parable, you will find, and this is what I just discussed in Matthew, when we were talking about, about our journey as servants, and how we are trusted with wealth, and we have to make that wealth grow. So 15 verse says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each accordingly, according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. 16 verse says, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. See that? Put that money to work. The 17 verse says, also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. In other words, there was an increase. The 18 verse says, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, the 19th verse says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, We've well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happy peace. Now, the 22nd verse says, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. 
See, I have gained two more. 23rd verse says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 24th verse says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. 21st, 5th verse says, so I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. But the 26th verse says, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. But the 27th verse says, well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. 28th verse says, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to another one who has 10 bags. 29th verse says, for whoever has will be given more. Listen to this. And they have they will have an abundance. Whoever does not, mm -mm, what they have will be taken from them. Oh my God. And a 30th verse says, and throw that worthy, worthless servant outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, you, you didn't do anything with what I give you. We can use this not only from a, a judiciary or monetary perspective, but even in our own lives, the things that God has predestined, preordained us to do in this lifetime in order to make a difference. What are we doing with that which God has given us? Something to think about. So let's talk about some things that church finances should have us do. Let's talk revenue projections. Now, we, we need a budget and it's difficult and we have to have a realistic approach. So we need to have an analytic way of looking at the historical perspective of attendance, how many people attend, and their and the average donations that people get. We need to run a report. You need software to do this. You can use Excel or you can use other uh, financial dashboard type software. And this will show us as we track and trend the average monthly giving from these combined households. And then we need to confidentially maintain those because you, you should be sharing other people's financial information. And we got to err on the side of caution. We have to have base projections. We got to have real giving patterns and seasonally. We should be talking about from month to month or times of the year when it's slower and higher or peak than others in, in the time of the year. And we have to budget and decide spending habits for the organization. And if a church is in the middle of a campaign, don't assume that your weekly giving is going to going, going to increase when you got people stretching their dollars to designate to specific things that you are asking them to give. And then we have to realize how we handle church members uh, and how we make take those donations and what we do with them is is. It's under the watchful eye of those who are parishioners. And people can start questioning our motives. How do we um, appropriately do this? And some leaders feel awkward by asking. Um, and, and so we got to be prayerful, thoughtful, and gentle in how we approach individuals about giving. Because we got we have to teach people what, what is this about as far as tithes, offerings, and you know, some churches do first fruits and all this stuff. How many, How do we do that? We got to have the right approach and we can't hurt folks' feelings and we can't badger them and, and uh, devalue them about their giving. I know some churches put their business out there in front of everybody or leaders. They they say, well, I'm giving 100. Uh, who else going to give 100? Put, putting people on the spot. We have to be careful. What kind of culture are we setting when we're talking about tithes and offerings? Especially in the pandemic and when things are real stressful for individuals during this time frame. So some things we have to consider when we're when we're talking about folks donating. So there are donor trends. You can look at these nationally. There's a study, the Barnard study. But this is research that shows five percent of adults qualifying as having tied, giving ten percent or more of their annual income to a church or not for profit. Only five percent. Most people do this on a consistent basis. And American born again Christians, 
which includes both evangelicals and non-evangelicals. It's 12% of those. And that was in 2012 that were only getting, that were tithing on a regular basis. On, now listen, it's 5% of just people in general give, donate. And 12% of church folks, 12%. So church members come to church to experience God and develop their faith. But we have to teach tithes and offerings. A lot of a lot of church people don't know that people that attend church don't know about tithes and offerings. They don't they don't fully understand that it is a principle. So these are reasons why members stop donating, right? So I want you to think about this: is members nowadays are having financial hardships. They're having deaths in the families because of the pandemic. They're losing their jobs. Many have lost their businesses. We have individuals that them, they themselves are sick. They themselves are lost their housing. So, you know, if you listen to the news lately, a lot of folks that had don't have anymore. So when someone stops giving to their church, it may be some other systemic problems that need to be discussed and they may need help. We have to look at personal finance, financial issues uh, are not talked about that well. And. We need to teach people how to be good stewards of their time, talent, treasure. And a lot of people need budgeting help, especially in, when financial times are hard. People need uh, someone to help them, support them. And so we, we, we keep this as an unspoken issue in the church. When we see folks are not able to give like they used to, who says something to who, who talks to the congregation about this. And the Bible tells us that when we have offenses, uh, they'll come when when uh, we discuss things of such nature. So the church should make it easy for people to get clarity about donating, giving, and, and these misunderstandings and miscommunications. There has to be a conduit for them to be able to speak freely about their situation. Embarrassing or hurting them is not going to make it any better. I'm just, you know, speaking from experience. So things to consider when members stop donating. Um, are we teaching principles? Are we teaching the outcomes of tithes and offers? Are we exposing them to what faith is, the substance of things, hope for, evidence of things I've seen? And there are other biblical foundations of what faith is really all about. And research shows or suggests that we don't take the time to teach about tithing. We 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 got to model what that looks like. And we got to teach them how to set aside time to learn in their own households. So we teach in the church and then we should be having them teach it in their homes. And we got scheduled time for this throughout the year and about the budgeting process and how all this works and how important what they give is to the community as a whole in the household of faith and in the community that that household of faith is in. So we got we got to ask folks for a financial commitment and we got to give them reasons why that financial commitment is needed. And it's common for us to ask members for annual pledges, but we don't follow up with the reasoning and rationale behind it. And we should. That's good fiduciary responsibility. We, that encourages people to give because they can see a target. They know why they're doing it how it's affecting the community or the church community and it makes people feel better when they know that their money is doing healthy things within the confines of the church and the community we got to teach people how to personally budget we had to have budget awareness bring other outside uh clinicians in to help with that we got to solicit feedback we can do church surveys we can uh have open forums or town halls and the church leadership needs to get feedback Especially when folks I am email we got technology with people, you should have an open door policy where people can discuss these things. And then a healthy church has a process to where even volunteers get feedback. And and you know you can tell them tell employees, uh, I can't fix it if I don't know it's broke. You need to tell them the truth. Nothing wrong with leadership. This is this is. Uh, Talent management at its best. When a leader 
tells his con here he, he or she tells the congregation the truth and they have that transparency that human capital will rise because they trust you they know you're going to be transparent and honest so they have to know what issues are in developing plans the organization has volunteers that's what we are in the church even if so you think about it majority of your revenue is coming from people who are volunteering Leadership is the art of influence. So how do you influence these individuals to help the church community and the community geographically that you reside? We got we have to also talk about how do we make it easy to get help and helping people that are feeling that it's difficult to tie. And we have to create a process where they can seek help and maybe restructuring their finances to do better to help help the community of God. A lot of times we, we, we don't have avenues or, or approaches that people feel comfortable to where they can learn to start where they are to get where they need to go, to be financially successful, wealthy, and secure. Some people are just bottomed out and they financially rebound. So you ought to have through prayer and support, you got to have Christian personal finance education. That's what it's all. I mean, uh, if they're broke, they can't get. And we need to talk about tithes and offerings and talk about this, this door where people can come in and be honest about where they are and, and teaching them how to support. And they themselves feel supported. So the church needs to create a budget and it has to be global and it has to be transparent, translucent, transcending, transactional. And we have to have estimates. We have to have projected budget, current budget. And we need to talk about strategies, goals, departmental goals, support goals. Who are we helping outside that the the uh, house of faith? And when we donate to other ministries, youth ministries or food pantries or, you know, youth director might say, well, I need a budget. The the, the uh, music department, everybody should have a budget. And you got to have folks that work that budget, that, that have a watchful eye and that are, are meaningful with the budget. And that process needs to be worked by all those that are part of that fiduciary process, whatever department they're in. And management has to get involved. It should be an overlay with your finance committee, your finance secretary, and the senior leadership, and uh, the person who's writing the checks. You know, and there ought to be multiplicity of signatures on those checks and, and transactions. And if you got an executive director or you have somebody that is the finance person, it's their job to ensure that CPA and bookkeepers are involved in all this too, because you need an outside agency or someone to bet your books. That's just something to just keep in mind. And that budget needs to be reviewed, it needs to be outlined, all the actual dollars where it's going, it needs to be analyzed. You can you can run do run charts, so you can do Gradle charts, you can do uh, histograms, you can you can do control charts. These are charts that, and I'm gonna be teaching about that this year. But these are charts that could give a visual of how well you don't. A lot of people don't realize, you know, if you can't paint that picture, you know, just throwing numbers out there mean nothing. But if we start talking about budgets and staying in with the confines of the construct of what our budget is, and give me a picture of what that looks like. These charts are very helpful with that. We need mid-year adjustments or monthly adjustments or quarterly adjustments, <laughs> itemized allotments of funds as the budget is being monitored you got to have a mercy bucket for funds right so you plan things can go wrong you have major uh overhead issues or failure of tools within the church the ac or the roof or things happen you got to create this emergency fund you can't touch it and the funds should grow every year and it, it it varies and here's the thing all your equipment and things have life cycles five year, 10 year, three year. Okay, roofs have a life cycle. And you should be budgeting based on these life cycles of these things that are tangible within the confines of your organization. 
And then we have to look at a systematic financial reporting system that helps us to perform and adhere to the budget. And then church leadership needs to get quarterly reports and, and they themselves need to report this stuff. So, see, it should come from the top, but people should know that they're just as fiduciarily responsible as everybody else. And we have to have our effort to raise building funds. Like your building doesn't stay pristine its whole entire life. It has a life cycle. So we have to focus on how do you pay down the church debt and, and, and how do you pay off things, not just burning the mortgage, but even uh, tools that you use in order to function. Like you might have a church van or bus or whatever it is. People need to know that there's good, uh, generous donations bring about robust, sensational things in the church. And what I mean by that, people ought to see that the money is going to work and it's and it's 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 tangible. A lot of us, you know, don't understand it. I, if I'm giving money, people want to see what is where is it going? How 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 is it being responsible? Church board, finance committee, and the secretary is the key uh, uh, gatekeepers of this stuff. So this team got to be dedicated to the mission and vision and strategy of the organization. And you should have it. Like every year, you should be talking vision, mission, and uh, and uh, your 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 strategy for the year. And that is in your the you should have a scope, and you should have a chart for the year. And you over relook your audit corporation bylaws, and have a strategic plan for the year, which includes your finances. We have to safeguard our church finances. So the finance committee, the treasurer, secretary. And the senior leadership, cash handling policies need to be written, need to be part of your article corporation bylaws, and it, and you got to have safe places to store cash when you can't make deposits, and you got to have supervision over volunteers, employees, or anybody that's handling cash, because embezzlement happens. Trust me, it's a it's alive and well, and it is from leadership down. Anyone that that has any reason to be suspect and suspicious about their lifestyle, things that can entice them, this could be a problem. So you, you church embezzlement is and non-profit embezzlement is real deal. So we have to make sure also profit margins. Profit margins are how not-for-profit organizations grow their capital. So I want you to think about this. So we can't take profits out of the organization. We have to invest any dollars that are above expenses back into the organization. So a lot of people don't realize that the real good church are not-for-profit. You, you got to take the monies that you make and put it back into the organization. So that's why the church budget is important. This is a letter of the law. IRS tells you this. And a percentage of the income um, for a not-for-profit margin. So so think about this. If a church brings 500000 in budgets for a 5% profit margin, it will be saving 25000 a year that can be reinvested into the church facilities. So you're putting money away. You got to know what that profit margin is. What is that percent set aside? And think about what it happened if you have a 10 or 20 year growth of that 5% or 10% or 15% or whatever that is. You got to develop again that budget. And God bless churches with tithing members and resources to work in the ministry, good stewards. And then we have to use that time, talent, treasure by having a good operating budget plan and control and you got to plan and control that spending and can't let it run away so you got to create a budget process and and unfortunately you you have some surprises in organizations where that budget to get out of control so uh and 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 i call it uh budget creep because you if you you, you don't stay within the scope of what the plan was for the year financially Things that get out of control, and then next thing you know, you your budget and creep beyond the scope of what you had planned. So you gotta have a watchful eye on that. And here's the budget basics: like you gotta have a plan, and it's gotta be control, a strategy of upper and lower controls. What that means is a fence can't go outside of that. We shouldn't be below where we're trying to what we're trying to do. We're trying to meet the average and the mean of what we're trying to budget for. Um, planning is futile without control over your spending. So, you know, if you got leadership that just, they out of control too. 
or you have departments that's out of control, run, run over budgets, won't work. You have to set targets for these revenues and spending and achievements and short, medium, and long range goals. And then you got to have a process that estimates these revenues and plans the expenditures and restricts spending. You got to have a plan within your uh, language or the Magna Carta of the church or the not for profit. It should be in your order corporation bylaws, even if you have to uh, have an appendix or addendum to your your uh, your order corporation bylaws or your operating manuals or SOPs, standard operating procedures, that type of stuff. Um, operating budgets extend out for one year and are divided into four quarters and the quarters are then divided into months. And then your budget view, review of gains, losses, and variances due on a monthly basis by the fifth of the month. You should have it. Some people say the third. Most people do the fifth of the month. And your budget allocation is based on the historical performance. And then you your, your expenditures based on historically what you did last year, what is your target goal for the next year coming up? You should be a year out. Like we in 2021 now, 2022, you should already be talking about how what is the plans for 2022? Because you're already in the year that you already planned for in 2019 or 2020, for instance. So to manage your, manage your performance on how well departments and folks do, should be the board should have those discussions. What are the results? We have to start looking at what, uh, what, how is it being managed and who's managing it? And that their performance, they ought to have a, a performance plan, a, a performance review, and and you have to coach, mentor, train, and counsel. Think people that's that's running these budgets. And they themselves need to be educated. And there's nothing wrong with giving them ancillary or outside agency training or bring somebody in to train them for that specific department on how to manage budgets for what they do. Budget process. So we got a church board and established the global budget. And then we have reviewed the projections and allocations for each individual department. Then individual department managers are responsible for creating their budget and their estimates and allocated resources. Then each individual department manager got to prepare budget estimates to make everybody accountable, accurate, and reliable. There's something in Lean Six Sigma, and it's called repeatability and reproducibility. And anybody who do what they do within those departments ought to know what they're supposed to be doing. And it should, if they're not there, somebody should be uh, accountable and accurate and reliable and ensuring that whatever was planned the previous year for that year is still maintained. And then the advantage to this approach is that you you have everybody find that budget and you have reasoning behind everything you do. And if somebody try to oppose you, then you got justification and you got to add layers of accountability, not only for yourself, but others to ensure that everybody's meeting requirements. And then once this budget is prepared, it's submitted to the next level. And then top management sets the strategy and goal for the overarching goal for the whole organization. And then the managers and supervisors got to estimate the requirements and they might say well that's great what you're planning but we might have to shave you down a little bit because this is a fire we don't want some other department may have much more of a greater need based on the vision and mission of the organization and the budget is established and sent back up the ladder for review and negotiated and go back and forth until it's approved or ratified now common manager concern Sometimes managers get caught in the middle if they don't spend all their money. Government is good for this. They'll say, now nah, I know a lot of managers say, no, nah, I'm gonna burn this cash up. But you don't want to do that. That's not good fiduciary responsibility when you do that. So will I lose my money next year? So if if for example facilities has ten thousand dollars budgeted for snow removal, but only use seventy five hundred because of the mild winter, should facilities be given ten thousand for the next year? Of course they should. And you what you don't want to do it was a mild winter. That's out of their control. Next year, it might be a bad winter, but burning up cash is not going to help. So, you know, and saying, well, I'm going to give you less next year. You don't know. You can't predict that. Next winter might be worse. Here's another thing. If I was spending my budget, what does that reflect on my performance appraisal? For example, now snow removal budget was over 
by 15,000. What does that say? Is it the manager's fault that it was more snow than planned or there was a variance? No, variation plays a part in all fiduciary responsibilities. I mean, it's tough. Um, some people say, I don't want to put a budget restraints to impact employees or customers or improvement efforts. So if scanning the scanning system for children's ministry check-in breaks, and there are no dollars in the budget to replace it, the employees and parents' experience would be affected. So we got to look at that. Customer service, don't chase dollars. It's all about a good process and product. I tell, I, I consult and tell people this. Make, don't chase the money. Chase a good process and a solid product and you'll make the money. And if it's too much focus on a budget or monies, it can take the focus off the non-financial targets or the qualitative aspect of why you're doing what you do. Quantitative things are great when you got good qualitative processes and products. So children's medicine is important because you make the children happy, they make the parents happy, make the parents happy, parents don't mind giving money. See how that works? So you got a positive customer response. You should be surveying your customers, making sure they're happy because everybody's a customer. Even the people you work with within your organization, you don't want to stove pipe processes. You don't want to sit here and alienate people. You want to make people feel comfortable working with you. And that means your customers got to be happy. Now, reasons you got to develop your budget. Now, listen to this. So you got to achieve objectives. It can't be by accident. You got to plan. And then you got to have good for, um, processes in place. Church, churches to plan and set goals. It has to be structured and church-wide initiatives. So everybody is part of this plan. You don't want to burn out certain people. And they don't want to give it. You want to get as many people, even outside the confines of your organization, involved to donate and help. And then you got to evaluate your employees' performance and how they handle money. And then you got to budget and have a strategic plan. And then you budget eliminates turf wars and spending and available resources. So people fight in not for profits and for profits for money. And so when you plan it for the next year and and but for uh, budget plan, you got to try to eliminate any misgivings. And so that means you got to have good communication in your organization and the priorities need to be set with clear uh, vision and mission. You got to be disciplined in your planning. You got to uh, have a good church budgeting process and tools, and you got to have good stewards that's running it. That's important. And when you're managing a church budget, you got to support the mission, vision and mission. Listen, if you're not, if everybody is not supporting the overall vision and mission, based if you got a balance scorecard that you're using or whatever it is, you know, you just got to make sure everybody understands what the overarching vision and mission is, and that affects your finances big time. So in other words, if you're, you're not articulating that throughout the year and having set goals and plans, money will get away from you. You got to understand that debt management, church, uh, Get a, get a church up and running, racking up debt. Any business knows, take money to make money. And it's tough. So a church is limited what it can do, especially when it's first getting started. Or if you, you're you young. And finance committees should have a strategy for paying down debt and have a good budget and then capital campaigns. And you got to have people that help solicit for funds. And then you have to have global causes. I try to tell church leaders this. Especially not for profits. Man, global causes work. Don't alienate people because you just want to be, you know, like, I don't support this or that. Or, and then you alienate people who can help you. Global causes like diabetes and, and children's issues and feeding folks and uh, housing. and that, Those are global causes, man. They, they go a long way. And they're tangible and something. People can see your efforts. When you do that kind of stuff, global stuff, non-global things can be sketchy and people can't see what their money is doing. They're going to stop giving. Either approach is fine, but the goal should be to get the church as close to debt free as possible and try to stay debt free along the way as you can. So people got the members have to have financial teaching. They got to learn how to handle their finances and your staff and the volunteers should do the same. And then you got to manage. Uh, your budget, your budget for training. Okay, so people gotta be trained. You have to budget for that. You got because people need to learn how to interpret charts and finance reports and business systems and dashboards and all this stuff. And the finance committee needs to understand 
who governs church finances, IRS uh, codes, and and other governing agencies and bodies. And that's not including the folks that if you are part of a denomination or a larger church structure, they have certain guidelines of uh, 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 reports and all that stuff that you know to come with territory. So you got to de develop a finance committee. They got to be committed to budgeting monitoring and controlling the church finances and how they spent and what's necessary and then does it fulfill the this and this the vision mission and strategy of the overarching goal of the organization they got to do that not their what they want but overall overarching <clears throat> it's got to be consistency in practice so training is the foundation for creating a culture of quality Volunteers got to learn the same thing. They got to have the same experiences, and they got to perform the tasks just as well as the ones that's uh, that's that's staff. And the result is when you are consistent and measurable in training, then what you'll do, even the children, you got to you got to give tips and tools and expectations for the parents and the children. And how do you get people that? will ensure that all workers know how to respond to like disruptive children or even demanding parents. This is all training. You you gotta have confidence in your job duties. You gotta have well descriptive performance duties or job descriptions or uh, uh, they call them PDs, professional descriptions. Who's contributing? Who's helping with the success of the organization? And you know, you gotta have insurance and all this stuff. People ought to be well versed in all the uh, administrative fiduciary responsibilities. You got to assess people's performances and you got to coach, make, and train. And you got to be as close to those individuals who are performing as possible. Don't assume anything. Leaders, a lot of church leaders don't know what the usher's doing, what the deacon's doing, unless it's, you know, money. But there's other things that help you to get money. So their performances with those other things will affect your fiduciary response from people, like how customer service or how people are greeted or what is their experience while they're at the church or away from the church. Or when they see leadership, what do they see outside of church? All that stuff plays a part. So volunteers feel value. And man, I'm telling you, you're in a, you're in, when you're in a not-for-profit, leadership is already influenced. You got to give these people credits because they're volunteering. They don't have to do this. So you got to keep them informed and engaged and, and you got to be willing to train them. You got to determine the culture unto which the organization is trying to appeal to the customers. And there got to be appropriate interactions with individuals, customer responses, safety and equipment usage and necessary supplies and materials. Everybody has to be functional. You, you got to ensure that people safely know how to perform their job. They ought to be oriented and trained volunteers big time. And then you got to train your church leaders. And then you got to have, I told you, you got to have that job description. You got to manage the volunteers. They Volunteers donate countless hours, man hours and man dollars, man. That's what it's all about. And then you got to invest in the time, time, and treasure and comprehensive training, coach mentoring training of these individuals. Well, that's the end of my presentation. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you passed this along. This again, this is Robert Cockfield from Get Up Community Incorporated, 310 Kitty Hawk Road, University of Texas, 78148. You can go to our website, getupcommunity.org. And again, there will be other training coming down the pipeline very soon. But I hope you enjoy this. Church finances, it's important. Love God and love people. God bless your heart.